Today we are talking about titration analysis. So titration analysis is a specific type of stoichiometry that we frequently use because it is very, very useful for analysis. So titration is a specific type of design. In a titration, we have a setup that looks like this. We have a long tube called a burette that we are able to control the flow of fluids out of over top. And beneath we have a flask or a beaker. Usually we do this with Erlenmeyer flasks, which are the ones that are kind of conical shaped because it's easy to quickly mix up chemicals, which can actually be useful during the titration. We can just stir it around and everything will stay contained while still mix, mixing pretty thoroughly. What happens in a titration reaction is we have a chemical inside the burette that's known as the titrant. And then we'll have a sample down below. And what we are doing is we're reacting the titrant and the sample solutions with each other. And we're going to continue doing that until we see some sort of a physical change within the uh, sample. And this allows us to analyze the concentration. Because what the burette is, is just like a graduated cylinder, it marks off a volume on it. But it's actually numbered with zero at the top, and then most of them are 50 or 100 milliliters. That will be down at the bottom. So it actually is telling you how much titrant you have added into the sample. So if you can stop the addition of the titrant exactly when it has finished reacting the entirety of the sample, and usually the color changes at that point, you can use that to do stoichiometry and figure out what the concentration of the sample was. So this is a very controlled process. It's also a fairly slow process because you need to do it multiple times. And the reason for that is that all of this is based off of your ability to react, to see when you've released enough titrant from the burette that the reaction has completed. And we are human. We can misjudge that. There's also a little bit of practice that's based off of your reflexes, depending on how quickly you're adding titrant into the solution. So we need to do this multiple times in order to get an accurate answer. So we know that the reaction's finished when we have a chemically equivalent amount of each other. And that's just a slightly obscure way of saying we've added the same amount of moles of the two chemicals. <clears throat> uh, often we use this in acid-base reactions, which means we have a one-to-one -one ratio when we do this. But we can also use it in redox reactions and other types of solution stoichiometry where we don't always have a one-to-one -one ratio. So we call that point where we have chemically equivalent amounts, basically it means that we've reacted everything, we call that the equivalence point because we have an equivalent number of moles of both of the reactants and that causes all of the reactants to turn into products. There's no excess at this point. This is one of the few cases where you actually get chemical reactions with little to no excess reagent. On top of that, we also have something called the end point. And people often get confused between the equivalence point and the end point, especially because in a perfect titration, the two of them are on top of each other. So it's understandable that they get it confusing. The equivalence point is a chemically reactive point. Okay, so this is when we're actually looking at the reaction saying that, okay, this uh, reactant has been completely consumed. The end point, though, is when there is a sudden change in an observable property. Um, usually this is color but you could do this with pH or conductivity as well. So that sudden change is caused by the reaction being completed. So it's triggered by the equivalence point, which means the end point often comes 
slightly after the equivalence point. Although if you're not doing pH with this, if you're doing something like redox chemistry, it can actually be on the same. So the equivalence point is when the reaction's done. The end point is when you see the change that indicates that the reaction is done. And the end point is also the point where you, as the chemist, stop the reaction. Let me say that again. The equivalence point is when the chemical reaction is actually finished because the chemical amounts uh, have consumed all of the reactants and you haven't added more excess reactant of the titrant. The end point is the point when you actually close the burette and stop the reaction because you have observed a physical change in the solution's properties. And usually, again, this is color. So we stop the titration at the end point. We figure out the volume of the titrant that we used up. But we don't actually start doing the calculations yet. And I'll show you what those calculations look like in another video. We actually, once we've done that once, we are going to get another beaker of sample and we're going to do it again. And the reason that we're doing this is that, as I said before, we are human, we are prone to air. So in a good experimental design, we have to do things to minimize those airs. And the way that we minimize them is we do the titration over and over, and we do it independently. We ignore the volume we got last time. We're not going to try and get the exact same volume. What we're going to do is we're going to do it again, and we're going to stop the reaction again when we see it's hit the end point. And if we have done this property properly, the margin of error that's allowable in the measurements of the titration is two tenths of a milliliter. So typically we will look for three trials within two tenths of a milliliter. If we can get three trials with that degree of accuracy, we can assume safely that we have accurately ended the reaction. If we get some that are way out, well, we need to keep doing trials until we figure out which one was the correct one. And then that way we can uh, narrow things down a bit. And in order for these titration calculations to work, we need to know what the concentration of one of the reactants is. Usually this is the titrant. And the reason that is usually the titrant is that we're actually using the titrant to do the analysis. Um, the sample, that way we can measure out in nice uh, even amounts. And if we have a limited amount of this sample, it means that we don't accidentally use it all up. So there is a practical reason for trying to make sure that the titrant is the known, but sometimes you will see problems where the titrant is the unknown, and the math works the same. So that's a-okay.